six o'clock. And since I have a bunch of stuff to tell you about before we get into the talk, I'm gonna go ahead and get started and people can still filter in. So welcome everyone to our fifth virtual event in our 2020-2021 History Talk Speaker Series. My name is Erin Quinn Belcho and I am the Lacey Museum Curator. This evening, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. The museum and where I am now is on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Nisqually and the Squaxin Island peoples. Lacey and the South Puget Sound region are encompassed by the Treaty of Medicine Creek, signed under duress in 1854. We respect and affirm tribal sovereignty, and as part of the city of Lacey, we work with the Nisqually and the Squaxin Island tribes in government-to-government -government partnership. And before we begin, I'd like to share some of our museum news. I can get the slides to advance here. There we go. Um, I know people want to know when the museum will open. Um, we're still not sure at this point, but it is unlikely to be open until we are in phase three or four of a governor's roadmap to recovery, which was just released. Our site is just so small and enclosed um, to host people safely, and we want to make sure we're taking care of our staff and our visitors. And although we are closed, I am still here. I'm working and um, doing a lot of things uh, to make things wonderful for, for people when we open up back again. But if you do need anything in the meantime, like photos or you're researching something or you just have a burning question on Lacey history, I'm here for you and would be glad to help you. Um, we are also working on a project to document uh, this time that we're in. Um, it's called Collecting COVID, a History Project. And we're asking people to submit their photos and share what they've been doing during the pandemic. And um, this is a couple of examples. On the left is a display of creative homemade face masks that were sewn by a local elementary school teacher. And on the right is a photo from last April when the photographer turned 36. For her birthday, a good friend got her some of these most valuable very hardest to find items that were on the market at the time and some still. And the bag with the red ribbon um, had hand soap, more sanitizer and a face mask in it. Um, the next thing that I wanna share, oh, and please do if you have submissions, if you have photos you've taken, if you've gone to the beach or making something or creating something or spending time with family, um, whatever you've been doing, during this time, we want to um, preserve that. So LaceyMuseum.org, you can share your photos with us. Um, so the next thing I wanna share is what I get asked about the most, which is the new museum project. Already on the site is the Lacey Train Depot and the adjacent train themed playground on Pacific Avenue. And these opened in on January 1st. So um, the playground is ready for use. And my kiddo and I have gone there and played on it. And the Parks and Recreation Department for Lacey is offering um, puzzles to complete in six different parks. Um, you can look for the snowmen and there are instructions at each of the parks and the depot playground has one of those uh, puzzles. So they're fun to solve um, and you can be entered to win prizes. Um, you can go to the City of Lacey's website and find out more about that um, also on Facebook. So the depot and the playground are part of what will become the whole museum campus. And we are currently nearing the end of design development. Um, and this project was made possible by a grant from the State Historical Society. And here is one of the latest renderings of the new museum. Um, it's really starting to come along and um, I'm ready to move in. Um, construction documents though are, should be ready by April. Um, and we have written another grant to help fund site preparation, including taking down the existing building that's on the site. And we'll find out if we get that in June. And if we do, that work will begin in the fall. So we also just got some exciting news. We have um, new branding with a new logo um, and color palette. Um, we wanted it to have a 
just a bit of a mid-century feel, which gives a bit of a nod to the 1966 founding of Lacey. And the color palette at the bottom uh, features that dark red and dark green that are in the depot. So it kind of ties it all together. All right, so before we begin, let's talk about what's coming next. Um, on February 22nd, I am delighted to share that our speaker will be Charlene Kreese of the Squaxin Island Tribe, who will be sharing her people's history of the seven inlets of the Southern Salish Sea. Say that seven times fast. Uh, this is a program not to be missed. I am really looking forward to it. You can register for this and other future programs online on our website at laceymuseum.org, then go to the events page. Alternatively, you can visit the City of Lacey Facebook page where all of our events are posted. All right, so let's get started on what we're here for today. For those of you who have come to see our in-person history talks, you know that the question and answer portion is a very important part of the evening and we would definitely like to keep that alive. So this is set up webinar style. Um, and so there's not a chat box like you might find in some of your uh, meetings that you have at work or what have you. But we do have a question and answer button, which for most of you will be at the bottom of your screen. And we will, for the most part, be holding questions until the end. But anytime you have a question, go ahead and post it in that Q&A section and we'll circle back to it at the end. And like we mentioned earlier, um, no one can see uh, what is being posted. Um, we'll be monitoring all of that. Now, let's get to it. Let me introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Nancy Cordell. Nancy Cordell, PhD, is a professional genealogist who earned a certificate in genealogical research from Boston University. She earned a PhD in anthropology, specializing in biological anthropology in 1991 at the University of Washington, Seattle. She taught biological anthropology to undergraduates for 30 years. Biological anthropology is the subdiscipline of anthropology that explores the biology of humans in the present and in the past with a strong emphasis on understanding and exploring human diversity. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Dr. Nancy is the president of the Olympia Genealogical Society, well, past president past of, the Olympia, yeah. of the Olympia Genealogical Society, and owner of the genealogical company Dig in Our Past. And her talk will focus on the use of DNA testing in personal genealogy research and some of the surprises she found when she investigated her own family tree through DNA testing. Thank you so much for joining us, Nancy. We are so honored to have you with us today. Well, thank you for having me, Erin. It's a pleasure to be here. And I see amongst my guests are at least one of my cousins who has been kind enough to help us, um, help me um, amongst other family members to explore the ancest our ancestry and um, the particular uh, scoundrel that I'm gonna be talking about tonight. Um, as many of you probably realize, uh, consumer DNA testing has become a part of doing genealogical research over the last four or five years. And um, actually it's been available for much longer than that. Um, so tonight what I'm gonna talk about is just a little bit about if you wanna do DNA testing, which company you should use, but mostly I'm going to talk about a particular case study related to my second great grandfather. And while we are still trying to solve the mystery of his true identity, along the way, we've learned a few other things that were um, kind of surprising and can also be um, either, depending on how, on how you look at it, uh, a cautionary tale or, oh my gosh, Really, that happened? Which hopefully many of you will, will feel um, surprised about it in a positive sense and not in a negative sense. 
because the past is the past and we can't really do that much about it anymore. So I wanna start off talking about one of the first questions I generally get asked. If I can, there we go, get my slides to advance here. Is, um, so I wanna do DNA testing, which test should I take? And there are five different companies out here. Sorry, my cat is being a nuisance here. Um, that offer direct consumer DNA testing, Ancestry DNA, 23andMe, Family Tree DNA, My Heritage DNA, and Living DNA. And all of them offer very good products, but some of them have been around longer than others. And so they're the ones I usually recommend. For most people, Ancestry DNA is the test you want to take primarily uh, because it has the most testers. Um, they have a database of 18 million people. Um, 23 and me, the other one of the other companies is probably the second largest company. And certainly if you are an adoptee, you should also do DNA testing there as well. Uh, because you never know where your DNA match is going to show up. It's not everybody tests at every company. The other thing I always tell people to um, be sure to do is to wait for a sale. Um, there are sales all the time. Ancestry DNA, if you went online now and ordered the test, it would cost you $99. That's the regular price. But if you wait um, until, I don't know, perhaps Valentine's Day, there'll be a sale and you can buy it for $49 or $59. So always wait for a sale. Otherwise it can be um, add up pretty quickly. So as I said, I recommend Ancestry DNA because they have sold over 18 million tests. Um, if you use their website, they have a huge number of family trees that, can, that you can use as hints to guide your research. You cannot rely on them as the absolute truth because they're all put together by people like you and I. And the fact of the matter is, is we all make mistakes. You ask anybody if their family tree um, on Ancestry or Family Search or anywhere else is absolutely correct. And the only honest answer to that question is no. We all make mistakes. So you have to use those trees as hints, not as absolutes. But Ancestry has the most trees available, except maybe for Family Search. Um, if you take an Ancestry DNA test, you can download your raw DNA data and then upload it to some other places, including some of the other companies, including Family Tree DNA, MyHeritage, and Living DNA. Um, all of those you would have to pay for a test. Or uh, GedMatch is another site that's free. Um, for some of these, there are additional costs involved, but we're not going to spend much time talking about that. So um, I say Ancestry DNA, but I always have to say, but it also depends because sometimes Ancestry DNA isn't the right place to go. So for instance, um, Ancestry DNA is a spit test. So you have to be able to produce enough saliva for the test. And sometimes that's really hard, either because you're getting up there in years or because you're on certain medications or you're just not patient enough sometimes. Another reason is because you wanna do some specialized testing, either Y-DNA or mitochondrial DNA testing. And if you want to do, if you have some of those caveats in mind, then you might want to do family tree DNA because it's a test that requires a swab, no spitting involved, which is kind of nice. 
the drawback is, is there just aren't as many people who have tested there. Um, unfortunately, they don't release how many people have actually tested there, but it's fewer. Also, if you want to take a Y DNA test, if you're a male and have a Y chromosome, the only place where you can get detailed Y DNA testing is a family tree DNA. If you're a male or a female, and you do want to do mitochondrial DNA testing, um, family tree DNA is also the only place where you can get that detailed testing done. There are other companies who do generalized analysis of those types of DNA, but family tree is the one who does the detailed analysis. Um, or, if you're interested in getting health results, um, then 23 is pretty much the company you go to. It has the most detailed health results. Um, other companies like um, Family Tree DNA also offer health testing, but it is not anywhere near as detailed. And Ancestry DNA has just discontinued their health testing although it really wasn't health testing anyway, so it doesn't matter. So um, with that little bit of general information, let's move on to talk about uh, our main topic. Um, our family's man of mystery, whom I refer to as my alien. Um, this is my, uh, father's family tree. We're only dealing with my father, father's side of the family. My dad is Harry Neville. And if you look at this tree, you notice that uh, I have a dead end. Right here, Walter Eugene Boyd is our man of mystery, um, our alien. And now a lot of people say, oh, I've got aliens in my family tree. They were just dropped from the sky and they, they had to be because they didn't leave any records as to their ancestry. And while it's true, uh, lots of family trees have those dead ends and they have their aliens. However, I have documented proof that he is an alien. This is a 1909 notice of location. This is the first set of documentation that a prospector or miner has to submit um, in order to stake a mining claim. This is from 20 February, 1909. And right there where the red circle is, is the name of the mining district. And the name of the mining district is Groom in Lincoln County, Nevada. Now, those of, most of you are probably not familiar with Groom Lake, but you are familiar with it by its other name. Uh, most of you know it as Area 51. So in 1909, my great-grandfather, Walter Eugene Boyd, submitted a location claim in Area 51 at Groom Lake in Nevada. Therefore, I feel like I should be able to, you know, claim that he is indeed an alien. <sighs> of course, I say that in jest. But Walter Eugene Boyd is a challenge. Uh, notice here, I have um, his name in quotation marks and notice that his last name, I have an E there in parentheses. That's because throughout his life, he has spelled the surname Boyd alternately with or without the E. He wasn't consistent. Um, the first time we have any record for him is his 1899 marriage certificate. When he married um, my great grand mother in Merker, Utah, which was, of course, a mining town. Um, 
after 1899, he consistently reported his birthplace as Texas. From 1899 until he died in 1926, he worked as a prospector and a miner in Utah, Nevada, and California. He was also, um, during that time, sometimes the superintendent of mines, um, particularly in Southern Nevada. Um, so his record before that is sporadic and his records after that are also inconsistent. Uh, he spelled his surname inconsistently, sometimes with the E, sometimes not. In looking at records, his birth year was listed as anywhere from 1859 to 1871. He didn't consistently report his date of birth, but we know from various documents that he definitely could read and write um, and therefore probably knew exactly when he was born. He just didn't um, report the year he was born consistently. Um, the only place where his parents are ever listed are on his death certificate. And I'm going to show you why that's problematic in just a second here. His youngest daughter, um, who was actually three weeks younger than my father. So my father had an aunt who was younger than he was. Um, Walter's youngest daughter spent 30 years before computers trying to learn about her, her um, father's origins and ancestry um, unsuccessfully. So why do I say his death certificate is a problem? Usually genealogists think of death certificates as very useful, even though we know they are challenging because the information comes from various sources and we don't always know who those sources are. So this is Walter Boyd's death certificate. Um, here is reported his birthplace as Texas. His father's name is listed as Walter Boyd and family legend had it that he was named after his father. Now, this is the only place where we see a different birthplace for his father. Um, here, his birthplace is listed as Louisiana, not Texas. This was 1926, uh, before they had the standardized sorts of state abbreviations that we're used to now. His mother is listed as Mary Spruce, and her birthplace is listed as Texas. Now this is all well and good, except down here, um, this is where it lists where the information on the death certificate came from, um, who the informant was for the information. And here you can see that the informant for the information was the Los Angeles General Hospital, which is where he died. He was in that hospital for about 30 days before he died. Where the hospital got the information is a mystery. I know that his wife, my great grandmother, Annie, could not visit the hospital on a daily basis. Um, she had to take a, um, um, a bus or a streetcar, excuse me, streetcar to get to go see him. And it was quite a distance from where they lived and they were quite poor. So we don't know if Walter gave the information, if she gave the information or if somebody else gave the information, although we don't really know who it might've been. Um, as I mentioned, his reported birth year varied drastically. And this is a list of 10 different sources 
with eight different years of birth reported. Again, we don't always know who provided the information in the various sources. So we can't be sure that the person giving the information actually knew his year of birth, or even if he was giving the information, if he was being honest. So when DNA testing um, really became commonly available, uh, that's when um, some of us in the younger generation started thinking, you know, maybe there's another way to go about answering the question of who Walter Boyd really was. So in about 2012, when I truly became interested in using DNA for genealogy, um, was also about the time that I became aware of why DNA testing. Now, why DNA testing is where they test the Y chromosome. Y chromosomes are passed from a father to son to grandson, et cetera, et cetera. And at the time, we had one living descendant of Walter who could provide us with a Y chromosome test. Um, in this photo, this is my great uncle, Victor Boyd, who was the son of Walter Boyd. And while Victor was deceased, his son, the young man pictured here, this is a photo from 1959, this is Gary Boyd, Victor's son or the grandson of Walter. Victor, or I'm sorry, Gary, uh, was more than willing to do DNA testing for us. And in particular, to test, to allow us to do the testing of his Y chromosome, which he inherited from his father, who had inherited it from his father, Walter Boyd. So to put this in a different perspective, this is Walter, who passed his Y chromosome to his son, Victor, who passed his Y chromosome to Gary. And um, I should also mention that all of the names of living people in my presentation, I am using because I have their permission to use their names. If I did not have their permission or do not have their permission, then I don't use their names. Um, so uh, just, just so you know, I'm trying to respect everybody's privacy as best as possible. So um, at the time, the most uh, specific Y DNA test available was what Family Tree DNA calls the 111 marker test, which means they were looking at 111 unique locations on the Y chromosome to see how many other men who have tested or had their Y DNA tested match those 111 markers? Uh, today, um, it is not the most refined test. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but today, a 67 marker test is generally the recommended minimum test if you're going to do Y DNA testing. Um, once I had, once Gary had tested, I also, and before we had the results back, I said, ah, there are these surname projects. Surname projects are um, projects that are based around, obviously, people's surnames. So here we have the surname Boyd. So it made sense. Okay, we're going to join the Boyd surname project. And this is going to show us um, all the other Boyds that we're related to, right? Well, theoretically, yes. The problem is, is that once we got Gary's test results back, he did not match anybody with the surname Boyd. 
And here we are eight years later, and I don't know how many more people have done Y DNA testing, and he still doesn't match anybody with a surname Boyd, which tells us that somewhere along the way, Walter Boyd either himself changed his last name or one of his male ancestors changed his last name. In the United States and a lot of Western Europe, as most of you know, generally um, it is the male name that gets passed on from generation to generation. Um, until recently, women, once they got married, they adopted their uh, husband's last name. So we had a very patrilineal society in that regard. Um, one of the questions that we can ans ask is, well, exactly when did the surname get changed? And the question, the answer to that question is, we don't know. We don't know. Um, although I suspect that it was Walter Eugene Boyd who changed his name, since we don't really have much information about him prior to his 1899 marriage. So what else does the Y DNA tell us? If it doesn't give us the surname Boyd, it tells us that Gary and therefore Walter belong to this R-M269 haplogroup, which is the most common haplogroup of uh, European males, European descended males in the U.S. as well, which you know doesn't narrow down our uh, pool of comparisons at all. Since 2012, uh, Family Tree DNA has offered, has started offering more refined DNA tests. And now you can do a test that looks at 700 markers. It's called the Y700 test. So we upgraded Gary's test and thank goodness he's been more than willing to let us do this um, over these years. That upgrade of the test refined his haplogroup to RFGC13355. That's the haplogroup he belongs to, and he is the only member of that haplogroup. So here we have the opposite problem. Before we had too many potential matches, now we have zero matches. And even those with whom we um, they do share some Y DNA that shared common ancestor is still very, very far back in time. So when you do a Y DNA test, you get a list like this. This is the matching test. And here, I do not have everybody's permission to use their names, so I blocked them out. But if you look both here at this upper list and which is the 111 marker test, and down here in the 67 marker test, you see that Johnson is the most common surname. And Johnson is the either the second or third most common surname in the United States. It's right up there with Smith and Jones not a lot of help. The other thing is that when we look at his closest match, who is Ernest Moxie Johnson, um, you see this number seven over here. This is the genetic distance. This refers to how many genetic differences there are between the two. And in Y DNA, a genetic distance of seven is huge. Sounds like a small number, but it's huge. And the way we can tell that is by looking at what family 
tree DNA calls its tip chart. The tip chart shows you how many generations back you have to go in order to find a common ancestor. So here's the tip chart for Ernest and Gary. And you can see that in the left column, we have the generations. And in the right column is the percentage probability of how far back you would have to go in order to find that common ancestor. So here you can see we have to go back at least 12 generations to get close to a 90% probability of finding that common ancestor or 16 generations to go back uh, to have a 98% probability of finding the common ancestor. For those of you who do genealogy, getting back that many generations is really hard. So when family tree DNA says, refine your results with paper trail input, well, that's kind of a problem. <laughs> um, we're trying to do a tra paper trail, but when you don't know the right name to look for, you're kind of stuck. But we also know that in order to do, to, to make good use of our DNA in our genealogy, we also have to have the paper trail. You cannot do um, use DNA uh, data in genealogy without also doing traditional genealogy. So this is a problem. Um, I also mentioned that um, we used, uh, we went to the more refined test, which is now called the big Y test. And we do find Ernest Johnson in the big Y test. And we find one other guy um, whose name I blocked out because I don't have his per permission to use his name. And that's partly because he's in Finland. But with both of these, we're still really, really far from being able to find that most recent common ancestor between either of these men and Walter Eugene Boyd. So what does Y-DNA tell us? It tells us that Boyd is not likely to be the correct surname for Walter Eugene Boyd. Um, but which male ancestor was the one who changed the name? We don't know. Based on the stories we've been told about Walter, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if he didn't change his name to escape uh, some aspects of his past, because some of the stories suggested that he had an unsavory past, but we don't know what that unsavory past was. Um, and those stories are just that. They're undocumented. Um, the details are unknown. We don't know how to answer the question. Um, you know, we can't verify those stories again because we aren't entirely sure where to look or who to look for. So what do we do? Well, the next thing we can do is look at autosomal DNA. Now, autosomal DNA is the DNA that is on all of the rest of our chromosomes. All right, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Um, the 23rd pair is our X and Y chromosomes, which determine whether we are male and fe or female. And the other 22 um, are our autosomal, uh, uh, carry our autosomal DNA. We all inherit autosomal DNA from our ancestors. Um, Walter and Annie Boyd had 10 children. Eight of them survived to adulthood. 
Seven of those eight had children. They had 18 grandchildren. And of those 18 grandchildren, 11 of them are still alive and have done autosomal DNA testing. And I'm very pleased to say, and I understand I'm very lucky in this regard, most of them paid for it themselves. Yes. Some of you know how fortunate you are to have others pay for their own DNA testing. Um, 11 of them have now tested an ancestor DNA, although I'm still waiting for the results on one. And 11 of them have either tested or have had their test results uploaded to family tree DNA. So who's tested? So all the people you see in this bottom row here are the folks that have tested. And I want to once again, thank them for doing so. And as I mentioned, at least one of them is on the call tonight or on the webinar tonight. And I appreciate she, her being here. Um, and you may ask, why on earth do I need to test all 11 of them? Well, we don't all inherit the same amount of DNA from every one of our ancestors. So I have a sister and she and I both inherited half of our DNA from our mother and half of our DNA from our father but we didn't inherit the same DNA from our father and the same DNA from our mother. We inherited different quantities and the real proof of that pudding is right here in this table. So here we have um, 10 of our DNA testers. All of these individuals are first cousins or siblings to one another. They're all grandchildren of Walter Boyd. And in the right column is the amount of shared of DNA each one of them shares with um, our closest match who is probably related to Walter Boyd. Um, that closest autosomal match is T. Johnson. Uh, I don't have this person's permission to use their name. They never replied to any of my emails. So we'll just call them T. Johnson. Below that is the amount of DNA that each of these individuals shares with T. Um, Bev shares 225 centimorgans with T. Johnson. But her cousin Jamie, or I'm, yeah, her cousin Jamie shares 156 centimorgans. That's not too far off. But look at the very bottom. Dora, who is Bev's cousin and who is Jamie's cousin, only shares 32 centimorgans with T. Johnson. If I only had Dora's DNA to consider in this quest, and I looked at Dora's shared amount of DNA with T. Johnson, I think, ah, well, she only shares 32 centimorgans. That's not a very good match. I'm not going to spend much time worrying about T. Johnson, especially since T won't respond to me. Well, that'd be fine, but I'd be missing a lot of information because Beverly shares 225 centimorgans. And all of those other cousins share quite a, few, quite a bit as well. So testing a lot of different family members can be crucial. And we could, I could show you another graph like this with another DNA match and it could be completely scrambled. This is not a pattern that's going to fit for every single match that all 10 of these cousins share in common. So it is important 
to test as many people as you can. Um, and to start with the older generation, this would be much more difficult to do if I were working with my DNA and the DNA of my cousins who are one more generation removed. It's still doable, it's just a lot more difficult. So autosomal DNA was our next um, challenge. So with autosomal DNA, we still had challenges, but we came, we uncovered some secrets along the way. So here is my great grandfather, Walter Boyd, and the next row are two of his daughters, my grandmother, Ruth, and her sister, Dora. And then down below that, you see a photo of myself and my father uh, many years ago. My father's been gone since 1986. So um, that really is a skinny and younger me. And um, since my father is gone, his sister, Pat, has been very useful in this regard. So why Dora? Well, Dora, I came to learn only in the last 10 years, when she was young, um, found herself pregnant out of wedlock in the 1920s. And as was common at that period in time, and actually still in some places today, she got sent to live with her older sister, Ruth, who lived in a completely different town from the rest of the family. And Ruth, my grandmother, um, helped Dora give birth uh, to deliver Dora's child and to take that child uh, to be to an orphanage to be adopted or to an adoption agency to be adopted. And of course, Ruth was sworn to secrecy and not to tell anybody else, which she didn't until some point in time, and I don't know when, she told her daughter, Pat. And not until maybe eight years ago or so, Pat told me the story that Dora had had this baby and it was given up for adoption. Well, not having heard this story from any of the other cousins and wishing to respect that right to privacy, I didn't share the story with anybody. Um, but through this quest to identify Walter Eugene Boyd and his ancestry, um, these folks down here, Alice Lee, Dois, Lois, and Dora, Dora's children, all did DNA testing. And oops, am I thing too much there? And I'm just going to use um, Alice here in my next examples. Um, Alice um, did autosomal DNA testing, as did her siblings. And this is a chart from Ancestry DNA that shows you um, Alice's DNA matches. Now, this doesn't look exactly like it would if you look at your DNA matches on Ancestry. I had to cut and squish and block out information in order to um, fit it on the slide and to respect people's privacies and also to just kind of clean it up nicely. So here you see Alice's sisters and her brother and two of her cousins. And one day while looking at these DNA matches, noticed, or I should say my second cousin, my uh, partner in DNA mischief, um, Millie, um, noticed this match in amongst all the rest. Stephen. Stephen was not a known quantity to us. 
He was quite an unknown quantity. We had no idea who he was. But Millie and I both knew the story about Dora. And as far as we knew, we were the only two who did. And it turns out that was probably correct. Now, Stephen shares 122 centimorgans of DNA with Alice, which is quite a bit. And there are tools out there online that can help us understand exactly how Stephen might be related to Alice based on the amount of shared DNA. Um, in particular, this tool, which is called the Shared Centimorgan Tool at DNA Painter, allows you to enter the total amount of shared DNA between two individuals. And here you can see I've entered 1,122 centimorgans. And down here, it's giving me all of the possible, possible relationships that one could expect from that amount of shared DNA. So this tells us that it is most likely that Stephen is a great grandparent, which isn't possible because Stephen is considerably younger than Alice. Great aunt, great uncle, nope, not gonna happen, same issue. Half aunt, half uncle, nope, same age problem. First cousin, possible. There could be a cousin out there we don't know about, but not very likely, um, et cetera, et cetera. So here's another way of looking at it. And here we see the likely relationship given the age of Stephen relative to Alice and all of her siblings. He is the probable half niece or nephew of Alice. And indeed, that is the case. Stephen's father was that child that was given up for adoption. And in fact, Stephen didn't know that his father was adopted, nor did Stephen's sister. So, um, Stephen and Teresa have uh, met their half aunts and uncles and have been lovingly accepted into the family. And um, he attends, you know, birthdays and whatever, um, even though he's got to come from, uh, got to travel from Oklahoma to California to do so. And um, was you know, very generous, warmly accepted into the family. So, oops, I completely forgot to take out that question mark there and change the name. Um, this is, uh, this should be Charles here, um, and Stephen was his father. And he, Stephen is a half niece and nephew. Um, we don't know who Stephen's biological father is. So, um, Sometimes these DNA tests um, bring out surprises, or in this case, they verify a family story, even though there weren't very many of us in the family who knew the story. So, oh, and here, jeez, ah, someday I'll learn how to type. Oh, sorry, this is the same one getting ahead of myself here, sorry. So Stephen is one of three children. So we had another little surprise. Stephen and his sister show up on the match list of his half aunts and uncles. However, I said that Stephen is one of three children. So where's that third sibling? Uh, it turns out that third sibling has a different father. So there was a surprise in a surprise with that particular circumstance. So 
So that was surprise two and two A, I guess we should say. Surprise number three um, was a, a little bit different nature. Um, surprise number three came about um, again when I was looking at DNA matches and came across this individual here, um, unknown male. And this unknown male shows up on my Aunt Pat's DNA match list. Um, he shared 100, 817 centimorgans. And I don't show his name because I do not have his permission. But he was another mystery because he fell in amongst all of these other relations whom we knew who they were, but this was a surprise. I went through the same sorts of tests by looking at, okay, what are the possibilities here? If an individual shares 812 Santa Morgans, how are they related? So how was this unknown male related to my Aunt Pat? Again, these are the greatest probabilities. And in this case, because of the ages, we knew it had to be either a great niece or nephew or a great grandchild. So here were the possibilities um, on ancestry. Um, this unknown male shared 812 centimorgans with Pat. This unknown male showed, shared complete, considerably few, fewer centimorgans with other cousins of Pat. Um, here I am, I'm Pat's niece. I share um, 155 centimorgans with this unknown male and here's my daughter. Chelsea, she shares even fewer. So Pat is the one who has the strongest match with this unknown male. And it's not a great match. Um, so I was able to contact the mystery male and ask them, um, they did respond, because this mystery male was trying to identify his biological father. Um, I asked them, all right, what can we do um, to answer this question? And I knew that some of the people who I could compare their DNA, uh, this unknown male's DNA with were not on ancestry DNA. They had tested on family tree DNA. So I asked, the unknown male to upload his raw ancestry DNA data to a site called GEDmatch, which he did. Um, GEDmatch.com is a third party tool uh, where you can upload your DNA results from pretty much any of the testing companies for free, which is even better. Um, you can also upload a GEDCOM file. A GEDCOM file is a file that contains your uh, genealogical family tree, not your genetic tree, your genealogical tree. And as I already said, mentioned, it's free, except for some of their tools, which you have to pay for. But even those are only $10 a month, which is pretty inexpensive in the scheme of things. So I asked um, the unknown male to upload to GEDmatch, and here is a list of his matches on GEDmatch. And you can see some of these are the same people. Here's Bob, my Aunt Pat, um, uh, Jerry, my sister Barbara, some cousins, here I am. You can see the strongest match here is with Bob. Bob is an ancestor to this unknown male. 
And when we put the amount of shared centimorgans morgans in here, we can see that the unknown male is probably the grandchild of Bob. And in fact, is the grandchild of Bob. But who's the father of the unknown male? Well, that we still don't know. Um, we know that Bob is the grandfather of the unknown male. But yeah, Bob doesn't know who his son is. We know that Patricia is the great grandmother of the unknown male. However, Bob had no idea he had any biological children, um, which um, as we know, can happen with males. You can be sure, you know, there's an old adage where you know who the mother is, but you can never be sure who the father is. Um, we still don't know the identity of Bob's son, only his grandson. Um, but, you know, that was another surprise. And that was also a surprise that came out um, okay. Nobody was terribly upset to find out about that history. So it wasn't a huge surprise. So this brings us back to my alien. What about my alien? Well, this brings us back to the genealogical family tree, the paper trail. And with that, one of the things I've had to do is figure out who Walter G Eugene Boyd is not. So for instance, I looked at all of the censuses um, in Texas for Walter Eugene Boyd and found a few people who could not be Walter Eugene, my Walter Eugene Boyd or our Walter Eugene Boyd. For instance, any Walter Eugene Boyds who were African-American. Um, according to the DNA results, we do not have any African-American in our ancestry, at least not in our recent ancestry. Um, that doesn't mean it's not impossible, it's just not very likely. We also know that any Walter Eugene Boyd who is still in Texas in 1900 cannot be our Walter Eugene Boyd because in 1900, he was living in Utah. Um, we feel pretty confident that he was born in Texas and that his mother was born in Texas and his father may have been, was probably born in Texas or Louisiana. We know that family stories say he was named after his father um, and therefore, we've always assumed that his father was named Walter. But if you think about that, that isn't necessarily the case. And maybe he was named after his father, but maybe his father's name was William. And Walter Eugene Boyd was using an assumed name. We don't know. We also know that Walter's youngest daughter, Mary Jane, was named after his sister. But that also is a problem since we don't know what family to look for a Mary in, and Mary's a pretty darn common name. So, um, uh, and I already made this point, sorry, getting ahead of myself here. Um, Walter could have had a different first name other than Walter. We also know that families, some of the family stories say that Walter drove cattle from Texas to the Dakotas. Um, during that great age of cattle drives from the 18, um, probably 1870s and the 1880s. Um, of course, that's another challenge because those migrations are not very well documented, at least not in terms of the details of the names of the cowboys riding in those cattle drives. So 
that's kind of um, left us with a bit of a challenge as well. Um, the loss of the 1890 census also could be a problem, or maybe it's not a problem since we don't know what name to look for anyway. Um, and in conjunction with the cattle drives from Texas to the Dakotas, we, we do know that those cattle drives ended up in the Dakotas and Montana and Wyoming. And all of those became states rather late in the game. So I still don't know who Walter Eugene Boyd really may have been. But we do know that DNA will be crucial to determining his real identity. Um, but until that time, we're left with images like this. This is the Yankee Girl Mine in Rhyolite, Nevada, where my uh, where Walter Eugene Boyd was a superintendent of the mine, and supposedly. He is one of those guys in the photo, but we don't know which one. And different copies of this photo in the possession of different family members have different information. So it's an ongoing puzzle. And Walter Eugene Boyd uh, will be, for the time being anyway, a missing piece to that puzzle. Are there any questions? All right. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. Okay, we have a question uh, from somebody who left. We can send her the answer later because she also gave me her email, but she wanted to know um, if you have an opinion about the DNA test done by National Geographic. Uh, National Geographic, my understanding is that they are no longer doing DNA tests. Mm. Um, and if you tested there in the past, you had to download your test results from that. Um, uh, last year or the year before, I, I, I don't remember the details on that anymore other than um, they kind of um, have gotten out of the direct consumer DNA testing. Okay. So does that mean that if they didn't download it that they are kind of SOL? Um, possibly, but we all know how those deadlines move. So if um, the results were not downloaded, it's worthwhile to find out if you can still download them. Okay. Although um, for genealogical pro purposes, that test was not all that useful anyway. Mm, okay. Um, all right, here is another question. Um, are there any, are there possibly any tax, mining, employment, military, law enforcement, or hospitalization records to be pursued? I'm assuming this was about your person since they don't specifically. <laughs> um, yeah, um, for my person, um, all of those sorts of records have been pursued. The problem is, um, at least prior to 1899, uh, we don't know what name to look for. Mm -hmm. And it probably wasn't Walter Eugene Boyd. So um, yeah, all the typical sorts of records that would have the name of his parents um, have already been explored and his death certificate was the only one. Okay. Um, here's another question. Um, have you used the WATO tool with this data? Um, yes, we what have used we have used the um, the WATO tool. The um, <laughs> I'm completely drawing a blank on that. Um, <laughs> it's a predictive it's a predictive tool on DNA Painter. Um, what are the odds? That's what it's called. Um, and 
um, the problem is, is that we don't have enough close DNA, close enough DNA matches to make it very who's who have family trees to make it worthwhile. Gotcha. All right, here's another question. What is your opinion of 23andMe diagnostic tests? Um, the health, I assume they mean the health tests. I assume that as well. Um, I am not a medical professional. So it would be, um, all I can tell you is that they do exist. Um, and like everything else, you should use everything with a, a grain of salt. And if you have concerns about your medical history to talk with your medical professional. Thank you. Also, you've gotten a couple of comments from people who really enjoyed your presentation. So that's always Thank nice. you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, is there a DNA test for mothers and daughters that is equivalent to the Y test for fathers and sons? Um, yes, that would be the mitochondrial DNA test. Although mitochondrial DNA is not, it doesn't uh, change very much. There aren't very many, um, I know this sounds like a terrible term, but any change in DNA, good, bad, or otherwise, is called a mutation. So mitochondrial DNA does not accumulate very many mutations. So it's not terribly useful, um, but it can be generally useful depending on the particulars. Um, there are also, um, there is also xDNA, which is sequenced by family tree DNA. Um, the X chromosome is something that, at least as women, we all inherit one from our mom and we inherit one from our dad. Um, men also inherit one X chromosome, but they only inherit it from their mother. Got it. Um, this person asked, did you find a prevalence of the surname Johnson in your AT DNA tests? Uh, no. But that doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean anything because the autosomal DNA is um, well. There's a, a couple of different things. One is when you're looking at autosomal DNA, um, because of the naming patterns in the United States, um, like for women, virtually every generation until recently, women changed their last name. You know, they adopted their husband's last name. So looking for a surname and autosomal DNA test um, can be, is of limited, can be of limited usefulness. Um, so, um, and also the way the autosomal DNA is transmitted from generation to generation, it gets shuffled a lot more. So just because there aren't very many people um, who match with the name Johnson on on a somal DNA test doesn't necessarily mean anything. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, another question. Uh, seeing your picture of the mine, um, it reminded this person of documents they have from their mines. Mm -hmm. uh, her family owned a couple of mines and they have all and we have all pay information, photos, and additional details. Is there some place I can send this information for public use? Um, yeah, um, there are all sorts of places, um, like local museums. <laughs> you know, if there were mines here in Thurston County, which I don't think there are any, you would want to call Aaron. Uh, <laughs> But um, the other place would be local and state archives. So some counties have county archives, um, state archives, um, where the mines are located. Um, they generally love to have that sort of stuff. And people who are researching, people who worked in those mines would be, would love to have them show up in a publicly accessible um, repository of some sort. I can agree with that for sure. Yeah. 
Um, there are a couple of people, by the way, who have their hands raised. I'm assuming that you put your question in the box and that we've answered that um, since I'm not taking audio questions. All right. Uh, does Heritage or Jenny.com DNA have accuracy comparable to Ancestry? Um, oh, yeah. I mean, well, Jenny.com, I believe you're uploading your DNA from other sources. Although I confess I'm not very familiar with it. I think but, you're right about that. Yeah, I'm not I'm not positive. My heritage, um, yeah, I mean DNA testing is DNA testing. They're all just as accurate as each other. The the difference is in um, the sample size, and all of them are growing. So yeah. my heritage has really been growing a lot. So if you're, you know, really, especially if you have a lot of different brick walls, or if you are an adoptee, either testing with all the companies or uploading your DNA, wherever you can upload it is uh, definitely worthwhile because there's always something, always new information to, to be gained from, from any of those places. Yeah. All right. Um... Another thank you for a great talk. Um, oh, here's a big question. If a race is a social construct, how do you reconcile using DNA to determine what race the person belonged to? Um, that's a totally reasonable question. And um, I appreciate your use of appropriate terminology because the DNA companies do not use appropriate terminology. Um, we cannot determine race based on DNA. What we can determine is the geographic origins of individuals. Um, so individuals um, who are from Africa are going to have more genetic marker, markers that are more prevalent on the continent of Africa. Um, those individuals who have Asian ancestry are going to have more genetic markers that are more common in Asia. Um, and the same is true of Europe. There is no DNA that is unique to any place in the world. It's just that some markers are more common in some places than they are in other for a whole variety of reasons, which um, I'd have to give you uh, my lecture on um, evolutionary biology to uh, go into that. And I don't think we have time for that right now. <laughs> Sounds interesting though. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's a very, that's a very good question. Yeah. And um, actually I would like to make, say one more thing about that. One of the things that the, geneal the uh, direct to consumer genealogy companies do is they call their results that relate to geography, they call them ethnicity results, which is also really inaccurate because ethnicity is cultural and culture yeah. is learned. It's not inherited genetically. So I also get very upset with the companies who use that terminology. I know it rolls off the tongue a lot easier than biogeographic ancestry, but it's um, biogeographic ancestry. Is if you came fun. up with a clever acronym, they'd probably be more inclined. Yes, yeah. <laughs> well, um, that's all the questions we have, but um, I'm going to close with a little anecdote of my own, which is I was adopted and I've met my biological family on my mother's side. Um, and I was able to get my original birth certificate from pre-adoption. Oh. Sadly did not list my father's name, although my birth mother told me who it was, but I don't have anything to document it. Um, so, I had done a lot of my own genealogical research through documentation, but what the, um, the DNA test did for me was to confirm that that 
documentation was indeed correct because I looked at the first person on the list, you know, and that was somebody whose surname I knew and I could trace it right into where they were located in the family tree. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, that is cool. I wish, I thought it would be that easy, <laughs> Walter, and it hasn't been. <laughs> well, there, you never know what, what yep. new things they're going to figure out. Yep, we're still working on it. Yep. All right. Well, thank you so much, Nancy. That was a great talk. And we had a lot of really great compliments from people in the, in the chat box. So we appreciate your time and energy that you put into this. Um, and we really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right, everyone. We'll see you next time.